Hey, I'm delighted to welcome you back to our three-part teacher's training series. In our last session, we discussed the factors of laying a strong institute foundation, and I hope you found it profitable to you. Now in session two, we're going to be discussing what it means to teach with a purpose. Now this session has a lot of practical information concerning teaching, and it therefore might become a little lengthy. However, I hope you'll stick with it. I hope that you'll glean all that the Lord has for you through it. Now once again, it is so good to have you back. Now may the Lord bless you as you watch this session. Hey, welcome back to our 2015 Teachers Training Series. Our second session is titled Teaching with a Purpose. Now in our last session, we discovered the factors for laying a strong foundation in our institute. During this session, we will explore what it means to teach with a purpose in mind. We'll learn different approaches to teaching, as well as understand various learning styles. We will also take a look at what it means to teach like Jesus. We'll learn the basics of lesson preparation and much more. Now I want to begin this session as I did in our first session by asking a question. And the question is simply this, what kind of teaching style is the best? If we're going to teach with a purpose, I think we first must seek to understand our own teaching style and how it relates to creating an atmosphere conducive to effective learning. You see, there are many approaches to teaching, and I am under the opinion that the only style that is best is the style that fits you, one that creates a healthy environment for learning one that engages a listener to participate, not spectate, and one that challenges the listener to action. Like I stated earlier, teaching styles vary, and the effective teacher is one who understands the strengths and weaknesses of their particular approach. Let's take a look at three of the most popular teaching styles. The first and probably most common approach to teaching is lecture. This is certainly a viable style of teaching, but it does come with some challenges. This is a teacher-led approach which runs the risk of boredom and has the capacity to reduce those in attendance to a spectator and not participator. Learning must be participatory, and doing so in a lecture approach requires careful attention. First, the teacher must be very familiar with his teaching material. If not, he becomes so tightly glued to his notes that the ability to engage the audience is lost and his effectiveness to communicate is diminished. Secondly, the teacher should use visuals to enhance the lecture. Just as there are many teaching styles, there are also many learning styles. Therefore, those who are more visual learners would benefit greatly and their ability to become bored is diminished when the use of a few videos are done. PowerPoints, posters, study guides are all good resources to use. Thirdly, the lecture teacher should learn how to vary their tone quality as well as speaking style. At one time or another, we've all been under the dreaded monotone speaker and became bored to death, creating highs and lows in our voices as well as fast and low speeds in our speech creates interest for the listener. Now lastly, the teacher should learn to use questions throughout the lesson. Remember, involvement and participation is essential for every class, regardless of the teaching style. Asking good questions is a great way to involve and engage the listeners. However, here's one word of caution. If you are going to ask a question, then allow the listener time to process it and answer it. Please don't be too quick to answer the question for them. Teachers need to become good listeners. Many teachers don't really listen because they are more concerned about what they are going to say next. If you ask, then be ready to listen. Remember, the listener needs to be a participator and not a spectator. The next teaching style for consideration is discussion-based and is a facilitator-led approach. Therefore, the teacher is viewed more as a facilitator than a lecturer. Now here's a few items to consider when using this approach. Number one, the teacher should use a lot of questions with teaching points throughout the lesson. In fact, asking good questions is essential to this style of teaching. 
emphasizing certain teaching points and the use of visuals could only enhance the experience of the listener. But remember, the primary way for class involvement and participation with this approach is through asking questions and receiving answers. Now, number two, the teacher should have a good understanding of what can be discussed and what can't be discussed. Because of the nature of this approach to teaching, the tendency for misinterpretation and misunderstanding between the listeners are certainly a reality. Therefore, the facilitator teacher is responsible to guide the discussion and lay the ground rules concerning items which are acceptable for discussion and those areas which are sensitive and inappropriate for discussion. Number three, the teacher must guide the discussion and try to engage everyone throughout the lesson. There will always be those who have a tendency to dominate the class discussion with rabbit trails and long personal orations, and the facilitator must learn how to manage these individuals. If not, dissension within the class will ultimately occur, and many listeners will either stop coming or simply stop trying to engage in the discussion, thus defeating the purpose of the class. Number four, use of additional visuals would need to be done carefully. Remember, the primary learning tool for this approach is through the art of discussion and speech. Therefore, the use of visuals is fine, but it should be done sparingly. The last approach to teaching is activity-based and becomes more student-led. This approach is certainly more suited for children and youth. However, if used correctly, it can be a quite useful tool for adults. Remember, our classes will be filled by individuals with varying learning styles, and some of them may require a more hands-on approach. Therefore, the use of role-playing, storytelling, small group assignments, and debate are all great activities to enhance their experience. Although this approach to teaching is a great way to involve the listener, however, preparation is a must. Careful thought to the central theme and application of the lesson must be taken into consideration throughout the preparation process. Also, attention and preparation for each activity must also be carefully thought through before the class as not to waste time when the members arrive. In our last session, I made reference to teaching like Jesus. And I want to take a brief moment now and explore what this statement really means. So how did Jesus teach? Well, he asked questions and listened for an answer. He also told stories known as parables. He often used object lessons and illustrations as a way of bringing home a point. Jesus also taught expecting application and commitment from his listeners. And he frequently used a little creative tension, if you will, as a way of teaching. Now let's discover what each of these mean in greater detail. As previously stated, one excellent way to engage your listeners is to ask questions. Jesus loved to ask questions, especially when he was asked a question. So what kind of questions do we ask? Well, first of all, there's the jump ball question. This question is used to get to the heart of the discussion and could go either way. Sometimes truth is wedged tightly between two extremes. In an attempt to discover the truth, the jump ball question helps to lead people to find the narrow way. Let me give you one word of advice concerning this type of question. Jump ball questions tend to create the possibility for a little more silence than normal. The right amount of silence is healthy. Don't be afraid of silence. Don't rush it. People need time to process. Next is the life exposure questions. This question is about the student, not about the Bible. It can be a great icebreaker to get the group talking and involved immediately. Now, factual questions are questions which solicitate reasonable, simple, straightforward answers based on obvious facts or awareness. These questions typically have one indisputable answer and do not leave much room for debate or discussion. Application questions are questions which seek to explore the various ways we can apply truth to our life. While commitment questions make the big ask, we ask people to actually make an all-out commitment to the Lord. I'll say more about these two questions later. For more information about asking good questions, visit www.joshhunt.com. 
Josh Hunt is author of Good Questions Have People Talking, as well as the leading authority in writing Bible studies based on good questions, and he has much to say on this subject. The second way we can teach like Jesus is to use one of his favorite methods to convey an idea, stories, or otherwise known as parables. Why did Jesus tell so many stories? Maybe he knew what brain scientists have discovered. Our brains are wired for stories. As teachers, we're certainly not storytellers, but when used appropriately and wisely, stories have been proven to be an effective tool for learning. Every effective teacher uses two or three stories per lesson and evaluates each story by two things. Is it interesting and does it fit? Funny stories, touching stories, shocking stories, all these can be used, but where do you find them? Let me suggest you visit Josh Hunt's website, which I stated earlier. You can also go to www.sermoncentral.com and they have a lot of great stories. You could use real life stories, stories from the news, Bible stories, go ahead and make up stories. Movies as well as books make great resources for stories. Remember, the goal of the story is to hold the listener's attention so their minds don't wander. This is only achieved when the story is on target, makes the point, and does not distract from the lesson. Object lessons and illustrations are other great tools Jesus used to get in his point across. If an object lesson is really good, it will never be forgotten by the listener. Now always ask yourself, how can I make this lesson come alive? So where do you find a good object lesson? Same as stories. Google it. Books, movies, personal experiences, and personal items. Get your own creative juices going. Now, illustrations are used to clarify or prove a point you're seeking to make. Again, use all the same resources I discussed earlier when trying to find a good illustration. Use pictures. Use stories. Use recent news information. Use the internet. Google it. All of these things can be used when looking for a good illustration. Now, another tool for teaching like Jesus is application and commitment. Effective teachers teach for application. In the Great Commission, Jesus commanded his disciples to teach the people to obey. In essence, teach them how to apply and obey what they have learned. For Jesus, it was all about application and commitment not simply trying to convey a few good self-help principles to live by. So how do we teach for application? First of all, let me remind you to teach with the goal of transforming lives in mind and not simply transferring information. Secondly, application seeks to help individuals know how to apply the truth of God's Word in their daily lives, while commitment is actually calling them to an all-out, all or nothing commitment to Christ. The two important questions to follow up with are, how will it benefit me if I do? And what will it cost me if I don't? What will it benefit me? And what is the cost? You see, application doesn't necessarily ask people to do anything yet. However, commitment involves the big ask by the teacher. Calling for a deep commitment to apply the principles contained in God's Word requires bold teachers with bold teaching. We need teachers who aren't afraid of asking the big ask. Teachers who are not timid, but lovingly and wisely call people to application and commitment, calling them to intentionally put the Word of God into action. Asking a question like, what do you want to do about what you've heard today, can help your listeners begin the process of moving past the transference of information to life transformation through the application and commitment to truth. Questions which begin with, will you or how will you, are great ways to help the listener in the process. So let me challenge you. Make the big ask. The last tool Jesus used for teaching was creative tension. Now I know you're saying, what in the world are you talking about, Doug? 
Well, in Scripture, we often find Jesus building a little creative controversy between him and others. Sometimes Jesus was a bit vague or confusing, all intentionally orchestrated. Why? It gets people talking. It gets them thinking. There's nothing that livens up a group more and gets people talking than hearing the two simple words, I disagree, come out of someone's mouth. Now, certainly I'm not advocating a holy war where doctrinal lines are drawn and an all-out religious assault ensues. No. However, I want to encourage you not to be afraid when differing opinions or contrary scriptural interpretations show up in your classroom. Embrace it. God made us all different. We're not robots. So doesn't it make good sense there might be a few opposing thoughts from time to time? Teachers, don't deny this opportunity yet. Be sure to take control of it. Well, we've learned what it means to teach like Jesus in the classroom. But how about outside? I mean, how do we continue teaching when the Bible study is over? You see, teaching doesn't begin in the classroom, and it doesn't end in the classroom. It's always going. How? With three important principles. The with them principle, the living stream principle, and the shepherd principle. The with them principle is based on Mark 3.14, which says, And he appointed twelve so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. For me, the key words in this passage are, so that they would be with him. Why was this so important? Why didn't Jesus just appoint them and then send them merrily on their way to fend for themselves? Why didn't he say, it's time to sink or swim, guys? Well, here's three points concerning discipleship making. The with them principle is discipleship making based on the principle of just hanging around or hanging out together. It requires the priority of spending time with individuals outside the classroom. It is discipleship which is caught and not taught. Jesus knew this and he modeled it. Now everyone knows water from a fast moving living stream is better than stagnant water. It tastes better. It is better for you. Well, the same is true for teaching. Teaching from a well of free-flowing living water is teaching from the heart. This is the basis for the living stream principle. This kind of discipleship making is current. It's up to date. It's about teaching what the Lord is doing through you today, now. This principle is a way of life, and it flows through you inside and outside the classroom. Perhaps the most effective teaching performed outside the classroom is the shepherd principle. Now, I know I discussed this concept in our previous session, but let me simply say that this principle is based on the saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And each time Jesus followed up with, feed my sheep or take care of my sheep. Now in music, the repetition of words and or melodic phrases are used for emphasis. The same is true for speech. In this passage, I believe Jesus is repeating the phrase, feed my sheep, for the sake of emphasis. In essence, he was saying, Peter, don't miss this. Let's not miss it either. I believe Jesus is driving home the point that leaders take care of followers. Shepherds take care of sheep. Therefore, teachers are responsible not only to lead and feed the sheep, but to keep up with the sheep. How? Well, first develop a strategy for contacting those who are absent, as well as those in your class who are in need. Secondly, social gatherings and parties are great ways to care for your members outside the class. Effective teachers will share a meal with every member of their class at least once a year. Lastly, social media is a great way to communicate and keep up with your group throughout the week. Technology like Facebook, Twitter, email, and texting are all great resources to use and I would certainly encourage you to do so.
Hey, right now, I want you to take a deep, big breath and blow it out. Okay, here we go. That's okay. Go ahead. That's it. Now, I know we've been going at this for quite a while, and I've thrown a lot of information at you. So, if you need to, please take a break, pause the session, and just get back to it when you can. Okay? Thanks a lot. Remember, Welcome back. Now that we've looked at different teaching styles and discovered a little how Jesus taught, I thought it'd be beneficial to briefly take a look at various styles of learning. You see, the people who will attend our classes this fall will be, all be different, and it stands to reason that the learning process for each of them will be different as well. Now, the eight most common learning styles are relational, reflective, physical, musical, verbal, logical, visual, and nature. Relational learners are people who are highly sociable. They make friends easily and are good talkers. They recognize how others feel and are drawn to activities that involve other people. These are the people in your class who relate to how others feel. They are encouragers. Now, relational people learn best in small groups with personal sharing or testimony. They also enjoy discussion, question and answer skits, videos, illustrations, and problem solving, just to name a few. Now, reflective learners. These are learners who understand who they are and how they feel. They may prefer to work alone, and they seek ways of self-expression. They are comfortable with solitude. Reflective people learn best through lecture, question and answer, discussion, worksheets, and study guides. Now, the next learner is the physical learner. These are learners who love to learn by doing. They are active, often well-coordinated, and like to act out stories they hear. They like mission projects, sports, drama activities. You can't just sit these people down. They like to be involved. The best ways to teach physical learners is by engaging them with various activities such as games, role play, and skits. The next learner is the musical learners. They are often good listeners. They are more sensitive to rhythm and pitch. They like to write songs and music. You might have music playing in class for these people or use words from hymns or songs. Using recordings, CDs, and singing helps the musical learner. Find hymns that reflect the focus of the lesson. Compare words of hymns to scripture. Listen to recorded music with an assignment in mind. All of this will involve the musical learner. Now the next type is the verbal learner. This one enjoys giving speeches. They like debates, stories, poems, and word games. They like the use of words. They like to read and write and listen. They may have a large vocabulary. Verbal persons learn best through lecture, question and answer. They like to brainstorm. They like listening to teams, personal sharing, oral readings, storytelling, debates, and all kinds of activities. Now the logical, mathematical person these people like to solve problems. They see patterns in the world, and they can reason through problems. They rely heavily on analogies. They like working with abstractions. They learn best through lecture, worksheet, outlines, debate, inductive questions, and questions that help discern relationships between objects. Now for the visual learner. The visual learner can see with their imagination. They understand space and distance concepts and relate well with TV, visuals, and representations of reality. Visual learners benefit from videos, movies, posters, charts, maps, paintings, object lessons, watching drama, and questions that ask, what if? Now the last one is the natural or the world. Now, these are people who can identify elements of nature. They may relate well to creative stories. They like to explore the natural world and see beauty in God's creation. They learn best through collecting or displaying items from nature. 
do nature walks by sorting, classifying, observing items from nature, by reflecting the creation and the creator, and through planting and cultivating. Now, one last word of advice. With the potential of different people with different learning styles attending our classes, it makes logical sense that teachers might want to consider varying their teaching styles from time to time, or at best, seek to include various teaching tools throughout their lessons. Well, we've discussed different methods of teaching and the different ways people learn. Now, I suppose it's time to say a word about teacher preparation. Preparation is the key to almost everything, and teaching is no different. There's an old saying that says, success equals preparation plus opportunity. Now, I know all of you are seasoned teachers and probably have your own way of preparing. Therefore, any suggestions I give are merely for your consideration and not intended to insult you. Probably the most important preparation for any teacher is the preparation of the heart. Therefore, let me suggest you take a moment before you look at your lesson. Ask the Lord to perform a spiritual health check on you. Certainly, Satan will use anything to hinder our effectiveness as teachers, and the first place he usually starts is with unconfessed sin and strained relationships. So once the heart is dealt with, move on to scripture preparation. Scripture preparation is so important. When looking at the scripture passage for the lesson, I want to suggest you first stop and pray over it. Then read it, then reread it, and then read it again. You might want to meditate on the passage for a couple days before you break open the commentaries. First, get a sense of what it means to you personally. Remember, stop and pray, then read the passage, then reread it, and reread it again. And then you might want to take time to meditate on it. The next important preparation is the preparation of the mind of the teacher. The preparation of the mind of the teacher. Not only are we to prepare our hearts, but we need to prepare our minds. Effective Bible study teachers prepare effectively. Let me first of all recommend something, and that is as you study the lesson, let me encourage you to please don't move too quickly to the commentaries. May I suggest you immediately bombard the scripture passage with questions and begin looking for the answers yourself. I want to encourage you to begin answering the who, what, the when, the how, why, and where questions. Helpful commentaries and Bible resources will certainly aid in this process. However, take note. Let me challenge you to do your own study. Ask your own questions and look for your own answers. Pray for your own insights. Ask the question, Lord, what would you have me to do over this scripture passage? Certainly reading what others say about the scripture passage is helpful. But you, your Bible, the Lord, and His Holy Spirit is more than adequate to sufficiently supply you with His fresh insight and knowledge. The last preparation teachers need to take into consideration is the preparation of their listeners. How are they ready? How are they prepared for Sunday's lesson? Obviously, this is the kind of preparation which happens between classes, before each class. How do we prepare our listeners for the lesson? The goal of this preparation is to prepare people for learning. Remember, the class doesn't begin when the class begins. In fact, class begins on Monday and culminates on Sunday. Notable author and teacher Howard Hendricks states, The law of readiness, the teaching and learning process will be most effective when both the student and teacher are adequately prepared. It highlights the great problem for teachers, the students coming in cold. So how and what do we communicate with our listeners through the week that prepares them for the lesson instead of coming in cold? Well, let me suggest, first of all, we communicate through every possible means offered to us by technology today. This includes email, 
text, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Skype, as well as the usual phone calls, social gatherings, and parties. I'm certainly not suggesting you have to use all these various forms of communication, but just pick one that fits you and use it. What do we communicate? Well, things such as the scripture passage for the upcoming lesson. Communicate the central theme of the lesson. Perhaps give them an assignment or something to think about before class. And you can certainly use communication to offer kind words of expression like, thank you, looking forward to seeing you Sunday, recognize their birthdays, etc. No session on teaching would be complete if it did not discuss the lesson outline or the basics of preparing a lesson. Now the first section of a lesson outline is the hook. Some might call it the introduction. This is the opening grabber activity which is intended to grab the listener's attention and immediately draw them into what they are about to experience in the word. It persuades people to pay attention. The hook can be a joke, a statistic, a story, an illustration, a group activity, or a discussion question, plus many more. Remember, it's not intended to be the lesson, just an introductory foundation for the lesson. Therefore, be aware of the time. The hook also seeks to convince people of the need to engage in the discussion instead of playing on their cell phones. One way of ensuring this is in the form of a promise. If you'll give me your attention today, I will show you how to forgive when forgiving is hard. Notice that this statement is application oriented. We should be about changing behavior rather than making smarter sinners. Again, the hook is only intended to be an introduction and a transition into the Bible study section of the lesson, not the entire lesson. The second section of the lesson is called the book. This is the Bible study portion of the outline, and it seeks to get the Word of God into the lives of the listeners. After all, people are transformed by the renewing of their mind and its truth that sets them free. Therefore, we must get the book into them by asking good questions and making the message clear. The four tools for doing so is explanation, illustration, object lessons, and question and answer segments. The book section is also where you practice teaching like Jesus, using the various teaching tools. Much has already been stated concerning this, so I'll just show you them for your review. Use stories, ask questions, struggle with the answer, possibly use the jump ball question, silence, object lessons, create a little tension, and love like Jesus. Now the final section of the lesson outline is the took. The took section is a specified specific and deliberate part of the lesson. It is the climax of the teaching. It's sort of like the invitation is in worship. This is where teaching for application and commitment culminates into a specific challenge of discipleship. The took section is where the teacher strives to create doers of the word and not hearers only. Asking the big ask, how can we apply this week what we have learned? By now, I hope you realize how we need effective Bible study teachers today. So what are the signs of an effective Bible study teacher? Well, here's a partial list. It's teachers that teach so that people live according to the Bible. They create doers of the word. They make disciples. They are disciple-making teachers. It results in a class that prays, people who serve, and individuals who read their Bibles and follow what it says. The effective teacher also creates people who love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind and strength. They create people who love people. They lead people to know their spiritual gifts and encourage them to exercise that gift in the family of God. They also teach people to abide in Christ. Effective Bible study teachers really make a difference. Classes are filled with engaged people excited about being there. Hey, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for sticking with me throughout this session too. 
I know it was quite lengthy, but I pray that you have found it helpful. Well, we have one more session to go, session three. So as soon as you are ready, have at it. Have a great day.